Okay, why don't we get going then? Um, so my name is Andy Conley. I'm standing in for Nevin Kapler today uh, to host the uh, Link Tech Talk. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Stephen Gwynn, who will be uh, speaking today. Um, I think I've known Stephen since we were both graduate students, which is a very, very long time ago. Um, and Stephen did his uh, PhD at the University of Victoria. He's worked on many different areas, uh, including photometric redshifts applied to the Hubble Deep Field. He's worked on large scale processing of um, image data sets. He was a postdoc um, in Marseille for a few years before he moved back to Victoria. And now he is uh, a science lead at the National Research Council in Canada. Um, Stephen has done pivotal work um, on both developing the infrastructure and developing the services for making data easily accessible to the community um, as part of the Canadian Astronomy Data Center. And it's a great pleasure to have him give, talking to us today, um, talking about moving object searches and uh, dealing with uh, metadata models to actually make those efficient. So Stephen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Andy. Um... So I'm going to talk today about moving object uh, uh, image searches and then the metadata, metadata models that uh, are sort of the background to that. So before I start, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the Canadian Astronomy Data Centre, which is where I work. So our, we are part of the National Research Council of Canada. Uh, we are a group of about 20 people. Uh, we've been in business since 1986. We originally started to host uh, a copy of the Hubble Space Telescope data, which of course, as everybody knows, is a Canadian, partially Canadian telescope. Uh, our mandate has expanded to uh, archive all of the uh, data from Canadian telescopes. And again, all of them are ones where you have a slice of not the whole thing. Uh, so CFHT, Gemini, JCMT, James Webb, Hubble Space Telescope, and then uh, a fair number of other ones. We're currently about a two petabytes of data, uh, 200 and some telescopes and instruments. Uh, we are expanding in the very near future to the goal from two petabytes to 200 petabytes of data as we uh, move into the SKA era. And that also includes uh, a side order of LSST data. And the reason we do this is that um, the, the reason for our existence is that if you um, reuse the data, a good telescope archive can greatly increase the impact of, of, of that telescope in terms of papers. Um, so the, we don't just archive the data, like it's not, archive is one of my least favorite words because it sounds like where data goes to die, whereas it's actually where data goes to get reused as much as possible. Uh, to augment that reuse, we have um, uh, a few data specialists on staff who process the data from the raw form into, into uh, uh, science ready data products, which makes the reuse much easier. Uh, we also have some machine learning experts on staff who uh, are, provide kind of a concierge um, service for to Canadian astronomers. Uh, we don't just process data ourselves, we also allow Canadian astronomers to use the same digital infrastructure to process their data. So we offer uh, data storage, user data storage, user database hosting, and uh, we have a science platform. Uh, and the goal here is to, with democratization, democratization of high throughput, throughput computing. So the idea is it doesn't matter what your personal brand is like, uh, or it doesn't matter what your institution's uh, cluster is like, we provide national infrastructure to the Canadian community. Uh, and so both those things, the data storage and the amount of compute infrastructure is growing by factors of uh, 10 at least to support the Canadian, uh, Canada's involvement of the, the uh, square kilometer array. And so the, the figure on the right shows where all the data from the CDC comes from. Uh, and then the bottom shows where all the data from the CDC goes to. So each of those red dots represents at least one download. And you can see we sort of deliver data to the entire world, not just Canada. So what I was talking about in terms of data reuse, this is a plot that's now a little bit old, uh, produced by Hubble, which shows how much archival data is, uh, how important archival data is to research. 
and for the Hubble Space Telescope and for a few other facilities, actually most papers are at least partially archival, if not totally archival in nature. So that's firmly true for the Hubble Space Telescope, which obviously uh, if you're recycling photons, the best possible photons are the ones that come from, from Hubble or James Webb, will probably be the same thing. But it's fairly similar for other telescopes as long as there's a good archive. So CFHT has a roughly 50% archival rate. Now this is all fine and dandy if you're trying to find images of your favorite galaxy, your favorite star, your favorite, you know, whatever. It's very easy to do an RA deck search. Uh, on an archive and download all the data at whatever wavelength uh, is necessary to do your, your thing. But once you're talking about moving things, that's uh, a lot harder. Uh, so I um, like to, so what I'm gonna be talking about for the next little bit is, is the SSOIS, which is the Solar System Object Image Search. Uh, and it uh, is basically, instead of using Google Maps to find a restaurant, it's more like, using Google Maps to find a food truck, or more accurate, where a food truck was going to be at some point in the future, so they could eat on Saturday at such and corner of such and such, you know, made in, and, and government. The, um, uh, so the way it works is I, the, the SSOAS uh, brings in metadata from all the telescopes on the world, not just the ones at the CDC, uh, and, it's pulled into SSOIS's database, it's indexed properly, uh, and the images themselves mostly stay at their own uh, uh, data archives, but uh, the, um, the, the metadata is brought over to the CDC. And then users can search for images of movie objects uh, by either object name, extrapolating from a, a short arc or uh, using orbital elements, or if you don't trust any of us to compute, the ephemeris properly, you can drop in your own ephemeris into the search tool. So in terms of, uh, okay, so the origins of it was years and years ago, uh, Andy was talking about how in previous lives I was more interested in high redshift galaxies. I was looking for Lyman break galaxies that equal five in, um, in uh, this data set called the Canter Fence Hawaii Telescope Legacy Survey. And I found one. So the, the pictures on the right there show uh, four filters. This is the, uh, uh, um, and you can see that clearly there's uh, an object, one object that appears only in the Z band. And my immediate conclusion was therefore it was a high redshift uh, galaxy, which is exactly what I was looking for. So it's slightly fuzzy. Um, going back to checking the individual images, I discovered it was only in one Z band image, not all of them. So it was clearly not a galaxy, it was a, something moving. But because it was fuzzy, I figured, oh, and because it was actually quite slow moving, so I blinked two images and the, the, the rate of the sky was quite low, I figured it must be, and it was also moving north-south. Uh, I figured, oh, well, it must be far away and in a highly inclined orbit, and therefore it's actually gonna be something quite interesting, even though it's not my main thing. So I spent the next three or four days looking for images in the C50 archive that uh, with the same object trying to properly compute the orbit. And it took me, as I say, three or four days to do this. And then in the end, it turned out not to be a comet or anything exciting, just a uh, main belt asteroid uh, doing its little loop-de-loop -loop at the stationary point where it starts to go retrograde. Um, so it turned out to be a, uh, a very boring object. Uh, but the main thing was after three or four days, it was like, okay, there's gotta be a better way of doing this than uh, going back and forth between the minor planet centers, ephemeris calculator and the c archive. And then JJ um, uh, Kevlar's, uh, my colleague here at the CDC uh, suggested, hey, you know what? That thing, thing you had, it'd be really useful if um, I could find all, I've got a bunch of KBOs, it'd be really useful if I could extend the arc and there was an easy way to do that. I said, look, if you build this thing, I will send you to DPS, which that year was in Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and it was like, okay, well, off to Puerto Rico I go. And in the end, I had a, my son was born that year, and I was informed that on no circumstances was I going to allow to go to Puerto Rico, fine. So I didn't get to go to Puerto Rico. And last year, I was going to give a talk on this at the IAU in Korea, uh, but it was very COVID in Korea at that time, so I passed on that one. And now I'm also not giving an in-person talk uh, to you guys in Seattle. 
So, um, as I was saying, we pull in the metadata, SSOS pulls in the metadata from, from telescopes around the world. So we started off with CFHT, and there's a picture of CFHT on, on, uh, uh, on Mauna Kea. We've added in uh, a very large number of telescopes from uh, a number of countries of the kind of world, including Hubble Space Telescope orbiting there, and then WISE orbiting the other direction on its full orbit. Uh, and then, you know, Oop, and those, so that was uh, another NeoSat, which is another uh, uh, satellite. Uh, and all of this metadata gets pulled into where I'm speaking to you from now, which is the window just above the blue door there um, at the CDC. And so at this point, we've pulled in, I've pulled in data from 225 different telescopes. Uh, 80 million images are in, in this archive. And you can see the list of all the, uh, that's a slightly truncated list of all the observatories that are in there. So CFHT, obviously, but also all the NORLAB telescopes, all the ESO telescopes, uh, LCO, PANSTARS, all these things, Subaru, all of them are in, uh, all the metadata is being held here at the CBC. And then I'm just going to slide through some things showing the buildup of, of the coverage of the sky since 1990, 2010, and here we are uh, a couple of years ago with sort of all the complete sky coverage. But again, it's, it's, you know, it's not just RA deck coverage, it's also the time coverage, which is key to this. So um, the embedded data comes to the CDC, it's stored for each uh, image, uh, the system stores the footprint. So the, um, it's actually just a rectangular bounding box around the, around the image, the exposure midpoint. Uh, and those are the things that are key for the actual search. And then, uh, I store, but don't actually necessarily allow you to search on exposure time, filter name, target name. And then of course the key part is the pointer back to the actual data. So I save a URL where the data actually lives at the individual archives. Uh, for the indexing, uh, I, it's pretty crude actually. So the, the figure on the right there shows uh, a CPHT mega cam image and then uh, an integer degree bounding box around the footprint of the actual image. Uh, and that's what the, the actual, the, the fast part of the search is done on. It's just that integer bounding box because integers are fast in database land. And then storing the integer uh, date of the, of the observation. And this turns out to work quite well uh, because on average, well, the, the assumption that all objects are on the equator and that all objects move roughly a degree a day, and that all images that are about a degree across turns out to be a uh, surprisingly good set of assumptions. And so the searches that are done are take less than six seconds, even when you're going over a 30 year time span for 80 million images. And so when a user comes into the uh, use SSOIS, they can type in the object name. Uh, uh, if they do that, the ephemeris is generated by a number of different ways. Ideally, uh, we have a, a copy of the MPC orbital elements and it goes to a piece of software that can piece it locally. But for some things, uh, either the MPC doesn't have the data or it doesn't do it properly. So you can, uh, the SSOS will go off to the horizons or the minor planet center or low observatory to find the object and get an ephemeris. Uh, or you can have the the bottom option is just try out each of them and see which one, have a, uh, use the first one that works. Um, or you can search by a short arc. So if you have, if you're doing pre copy you can enter in a bunch of data in MPC format and then have the, the thing compute a, a longer arc and search along that arc for your favorite object, for images of your favorite object. Uh, and then, or if you don't uh, trust that fitting to do, you can do your own fitting and get your own orbital elements and then type those into the, the, the um, uh, to SSOS and have then the orbits computed using those, those orbital elements mm -hmm. and they are in the, the search apps along that ephemeris. Or if you don't trust it to do anything right, you can type in your own ephemeris. I mean, we'll probably cut and paste your own ephemeris into the, into the, um, into the search box and it will search along that. Uh, and then the, the, the parts of the thing that I've shown below there is that you can add a positional uncertainty uh, in arc seconds or other units. Uh, and it will sort of expand the search to include the, the, uh, the uncertainty ellipse. 
uh, or you can resolve, uh, you can, once you found the image for some of the data in there, I can get actual resolve to the, which extension. So it's not just the Megacam image in particular, but actually the Megacam extension so that you have a smaller uh, image to download and search. Or it can actually roll, uh, go back and give you the X and Y coordinates on that individual extension, uh, which again makes your search uh, a bit faster. You can down select by telescopes and instrument lists. So for, uh, in particular, WISE uh, covers an awful lot of the sky. So you might want to eliminate that for your, some search terms, or if you're only interested in CPHT data, then you could uh, select, um, down select to, to just one telescope. Uh, the query executions, the, query, the, the search is not pre-cooked um, and that's sort of the key thing. So some of the other um, uh, search, moving object search tools out there, for example, ESIS one actually sort of pre-does the search beforehand where they cross match the orbits of a large number of objects with images, for example, the Hubble archive. And they have a, a database of all the known objects that have shown up in all the known uh, Hubble images. And that's fine, except if you have a new object, then you're, it, it makes it considerably less useful. And so the search is not pre-cooked, it happens on the fly um, each, each time that you come in with an ephemeris. Um, and then, as I said, there was a, a number of, of um, uh, ways the ephemeris can be generated. It's expressed in the line segments uh, in our end deck uh, at a 24 hour cadence. So sort of straight lines in between there. And then it builds up uh, integer building box blocks around that in our deck MGD. And then it creates a temporary table and joins that ephemeris table to the metadata table. So it's instead of a 2D uh, RA deck search, it's a 3D, uh, uh, it's a, you know, you're joining a 2D to a, uh, a 2D line to a 3D um, set of volumes. Uh, and then, yeah, so the, as I was saying, the integers matching is quite fast. And then it, once there's a close match, it uh, downscales to it, to the, the proper footprint of the actual image, and then returns that list to the user. And at the moment, we're running at sort of five to 10 seconds in terms of search time, uh, except for a few times when the database is very busy, in which case it takes slightly longer. Uh, and then the search results are uh, a list of all the images and then link back to wherever the images are. So this particular example so shows CPC mega cam images where the link is back to us and the CDC. But there are, uh, if, if you, the search, search result with Subaru would be links back to Subaru if it links was, if the image that you're finding was a DCAM image, you would go to the more lab at, uh, and so on. Uh, I've talked about a little bit about how the um, SSOS is used uh, in an interactive way, but can also be used programmatically. So there's a not particularly well-documented API. Uh, the bottom is sort of the simplest possible way of doing something which is just like you do a W get to that long URL and you will get back all the images of Erikoff. Um, so uh, the, the way one would find that your, um, that API is at the bottom of each of the search results, there's a URL says download results in TSV and uh, it's in a, you know, do a search that is close to the kind of one you want to do and you can just modify that, that URL and uh, edit it to meet your needs. And so people have actually um, found this out even before I documented it, and I've documented fairly crudely because uh, I haven't had time to do a, a pro proper job, but found it and will have done up to you know a million searches per day, possibly 10 million. And that works, I didn't even notice that there was a, uh, that was happening. So that's, it's, it's a fairly robust and solid system. And the only time we've ever had a problem, but well, two times, one was when someone selected MPC as the um, orbit, the ephemeris generator and MPC complained that we were hitting the system a million times a day. And we please stop because of course it looks like the CBC is doing this, not the user is doing this. And the other time we had a problem was when the, it, they were hitting JPL Horizons server a million times a day. And they didn't complain, but the JPL Horizons thing went offline for uh, a few hours. And so, but other than that, if you just use stuff going on the CDC, it seems to be able to handle 
uh, fairly large number of requests. Um, uh, uh, and we asked people to limit their usage to 10, 10 threads, but uh, at this point, we don't actually know what the upper limit is really. Uh, so people, what do people use this for? One, is, one the main thing is, is uh, pre-covery. Uh, so this sh slide is a screenshot, well, is a uh, picture I took from the back of the audience where someone else was uh, um, using SSOIS in their talk. Uh, so that was that was fun to watch, uh, and it shows that you know here we go. SSOS saved the saved the world because we, you know, uh, we were able to use pre-covered image to to find uh, a potentially hazardous asteroid and move it from the uh, uh, remove it as a possible impactor. Other people use it as for active asteroids, so uh, searching through images, if something pops up and uh, has something weird happen to it, you can go back and look historically to see what, what had happened before uh, it had become active. Uh, it's also used in some survey management, uh, some surveys to manage the, 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 the data where, for example, uh, BOSSES and CPEPs and various other things use uh, SSOS programmatically to keep track of all their KBOs. Uh, it gets cited, which surprises me because no one ever cites a search engine. Uh, and um, um, so, seventy-one citations, uh, you know, which is excellent for a, for a search engine, not great for uh, perhaps a normal paper. And then, as I was saying, some people will submit uh, millions of queries. Um, okay, I'm going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about uh, a comp something now for something completely different, which is the the uh, CAOM, which is the CDC's uh, Common Archive Observation Model. So SSOS does not currently run on CAOM. It runs on a much simpler uh, metadata model, but I want to talk about the good metadata model for, uh, before doing a compare and contrast between the two systems and to talk about why I chose one versus the other. So CAOM, the goal here is to provide a completely comprehensive uh, system for metadata. Uh, development started uh, uh, over 10 years ago, and it was actually driven by the fact that we had to translate all of our web pages into French for federal Canadian government regulations. And the, I, at the time, we had one uh, web page per telescope, mm -hmm. per instrument in some cases, and it was going to be a giant pain. And we also, behind that, had one database per for each of these instruments, which was also a giant pain. So we needed to consolidate everything into one thing. Uh, and that turned out to be a um, fantastic, uh, what's his name, crisis tunity, because it's a much better system. And it's much easier, easier for now for us now to absorb new archives into our system because we have CAOM and we can just, uh, we don't have to build a new database, build a new set of tables. There's a system that already exists. Uh, it's being adopted by Space Telescope. Uh, it's been adopted. It's being adopted by uh, IPAC. Uh, we went through an exercise of scraping other external archives into a, or into COM and making those available via the, the CDC search tool. Um, we're now kind of expanding it to accommodate radio data. Uh, we had some support, for, but now that we're moving into the SKA era, we're, we're realizing that we're, there were some deficiencies. Um, COM is what powers the, the, the CDC's main search web page, but there's also a tap interface, which is extremely powerful. So you can do something like select star from observation, and then 10 minutes later, you'll have a complete list of all the uh, uh, images that are at the CDC. Uh, so I'm going to go through COM and how that works. Uh, and it's a fairly, so there's no interesting way to discuss a metadata model. So I've got a figure on the right there that is just basically the, the, the UML from, from, from COM. And I'm gonna, in a, in a couple of minutes, go through the, the, main, the main points of it. So it's a kind of a hierarchical system. And at the top level, you have an observation, which is um, uh, all photons gathered from the same place at the same time. Uh, and that's sort of the top, layer of this thing. But our observation can actually have multiple different planes. The plane uh, is sort of the, 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 
uh, different states that a, a image could be at. So for example, going back to the Ruben example, you can have a raw image, you can have a tendered image, you can have a, a different image, you can have a fully calibrated thing. So one observation might have four planes, for example, in this, uh, in this example. Uh, and then the next level below plane is the artifact, which is now you're actually talking about the, the way um, uh, the data is actually represented uh, it's being held on disk. So one artifact equals one file on disk. So uh, for Megacam, each um, uh, the, each image is actually a multi-extension fit. So that would be one artifact. For Ruben, I think you're extor storing each um, file as a, e each image, each extension is being s s uh, stored as a separate file. So that would be a slightly different uh, um, cardinality to it. But on the other hand, if it's a calibrated thing, it's going to have multiple extensions to it. Uh, a part is the uh, uh, the next level down is the logical um, uh, the, the part of a file. So it, it gives, this is a fits extension or uh, a HDF5 group. And that would be uh, one extension of, of, um, of a detailed uh, Ruben image. And then below that is a chunk, which is um, uh, <laughs> a subsection of a part, and then uh, if you have a you know you have a spectrum that's in a in a uh, some people to store a spectra where one column is the flux and one column is the uh, uh, the other column is the wavelength, and that would be an example of different chunks. And to go through sort of zoom in on various parts of them to show what kinds of metadata is stored at each level. So at the observation, you can store stuff like. The, uh, uh, which telescope it was, mm -hmm. what the target was, what the environment was in terms of seeing or humidity or what have you. Uh, and so those things are stored at the observation level. Uh, at the plane level, you're storing stuff like the actual footprint of the, of the image, so that's position, but also the filter that was used, what time was the, uh, the time bounds of it, polarization, uh, and then um, things about limiting magnitude are all stored at the at the plane level, and then provenance. If there's different ways of process, processing it, um, you would store the the the, the um, software that was used to generate the uh, that plane. Uh, at the artifact level, you're storing things about the actual physical file. So the um, uh, and that's actually where the uh, access control is stored. So the release. Uh, uh, data stored at the uh, at the um, artifact level, and then the things about the size of the file, the checksum, and whatnot, all still stored there. And then uh, part and chunk um, will contain uh, even more detailed information about what's happening. And so chunk in particular has a bunch of stuff about the 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 spatial, spectral, temporal double CS of, of, of the file. Uh, and for many cases. Each part will have exactly one chunk, and so this is like the extension will have the WCS of the of the uh, of that extension will be stored in um, at the uh, chunk level, but really it's it's just part of the part. Okay, so two different conflicting systems here, not conflicting, but but with with um, um, two different systems that that are that are sort of serve slightly two different purposes. So this is the OS, uh, as I said, records only the bare minimum of stuff about the um, exposure. So really it's only interested in the footprint and the time. Everything else is kind of bonus, but uh, whereas a CM records is capable of recording absolutely everything about an observation so that you never need to go back to the header of that 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 file. Everything you wanted to know about that thing is being stored in COM. And then SSOS only stores uh, images because if it's a solar system image search, you only want images, whereas COM stores everything, data cubes, spectra, time series, et cetera. So advantage, COM. Ease of ingestion. Well, okay, the metadata mapping for SSOS, because it's quite a simple model, takes about half a day. I usually will take a Friday afternoon to go and scrape some archive. And then the populating the data base is very, very quickly because it's just a bulk load. Whereas on CM side, data engineering, mapping all the bits and pieces you might want to know about uh, an image or a file uh, could take a while because it's fairly complex and baroque. 
and then because it's stored in multiple different tables, you have and you want to do this atomically. It's a couple of, it's a couple hundred milliseconds uh, to to put in insert one file, insert one observation, uh, and that of course means that you know um, populate the database can take multiple multiple uh, multiple days. So in that case, the advantage is SSOAS. In terms of query speed, uh, SSOS is the clear winner uh, because even though it's a very crude and even naive indexing system, it works surprisingly well. Uh, I've tried to move my grade SSOS over to using CAOM, um, but because the spatial information is, this, is, is stored a couple levels down, uh, the fo footprint is stored at the plane level, you have to do a join, which means that the query speed is, is uh, significantly slower at the moment. And then the so-called bus factor uh, um, or lottery factor, if you want to be um, more optimistic. Uh, SSOS is maintained by me. Uh, I am not a developer, I'm an astronomer, so it's programmed in a astronomy type way, uh, whereas a COM has developed, was developed by real developers and is multi-institution. So the best of course would be both. For comprehensiveness, COM is a clear winner, so we should adopt that. And then for, uh, if you were just gonna do one archive, for example, SST, COM uh, uh, would be, is cumbersome, but for a single archive, it's totally manageable. And then once you've, uh, although if you're trying to download, uh, do a whole archive at once, it's quite slow. 200 milliseconds is obviously a lot faster than one LSST exposure. So that would be, um, it would still be usable. But the query speed, um, the solution there would be to actually have a view for uh, on, on the, on the, um, on the COM tables or perhaps a periodic select that populates a more compact table for sort of system image searches. Uh, and it might be possible we to, although I'm using, as I say, a very crude system for SSOS, which works, works well, PGSphere is a bit slower, but maybe HipsCat is something like HipsCat would be able to speed uh, things up. And then in terms of a bus factor, the um, you would need to get more than one person working on it. So not just me. So I'll put up a, uh, a summary slide here, and then the animation on the right there, which may or may not be working over Zoom, is uh, I had a separate project looking through all the mega cam archive for moving objects, and I found one, and I was able to track it using SSOAS, uh, and it turned out not to be a boring old uh, main belt asteroid, but in fact a centaur, extremely high inclinations centaur, uh, and so you know that was cool. And then the other part that was uh, good was uh, using SSOS, it was able to extend the arc in not three or four days, but you know, uh, you know, uh, an hour, I think it took me to, to extend it to uh, a multi-month multi arc. Um, so I'll just leave uh, leave, it, leave up the, uh, the, the, the summary slide and uh, uh, take questions. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so we have time for some questions. Um, can I, do, you, do you want to start by asking your question? Yes, in the chat. I know someone, um, I know that uh, David answered part of that, but maybe you want to um, address it. Sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a detailed question, but um, you know, for, for getting astronomers to yeah, you know, use and like uh, CAOM and uh, sort of terminology can be uh, important and um, uh, labeling, you know, the actual image files artifact seems to invite confusion with what we typically refer to as image artifacts as being stuffed in the image that we should ignore as not being astronomical. Yeah, uh, you're not wrong. <laughs> Uh, the term, the labeling of things, I in in um, one of my problems with the CAOM is a lot of the terminology is trying to be uh, domain agnostic as possible, uh, which means that it's incomprehensible to all astronomers, not just radio astronomers. So, for example, if you wanted to have something 
uh, that was optical focus, you use words like plate scale or whatever when you're talking about the, the, the spatial resolution of the thing. Uh, uh, Pat Dowler, who's the lead, has sort of picked words that I wouldn't necessarily choose. And you have to sort of you have to sort of sit down for a day or maybe half a day really, and sort of really get into the ethos of how CDO works in order to um, grasp the ter terminology and where stuff is. Once you do that, it, it becomes second nature very, very quickly. But I will agree that there are some poor word choices. The other one, for example, is observation itself. So when I published the SSOIS paper, I talked about observation, observation, observation when I meant image. Uh, whereas of course in, uh, the reviewer naturally assumed observation means actual instance of the of a of a asteroid being observed. So it's not uh, the image; it's the actually RA and deck position, uh, sorry, RA deck position and time of that particular um, um, where that asteroid was and when it was. So I had to basically do a set of observation to image for the paper. So uh, I would agree that it does cause, a it can cause problems, but they're not insurmountable. Do we have um, other questions? So while I was thinking, I, did, I had a couple of questions for you, um, Stephen. One was, uh, when you're currently doing the um, asteroid searching are you you're returning pointers to the full image is that right it depends on uh what user asked for and what i can actually usefully achieve so for for super mega cam where i have a very good handle what the wcs is uh because i generate it myself then i can return and people ask for it i can return pointers back to the individual extension because uh, the, the CDC archives allows allows you to point to, like, do a cutout, which is just one extension, no problem. If it, you're asking for the same thing for DECAM, uh, I'm less confident about the DECAM astrometry in the archive, although that would, I could revisit that. And then as far as I know, NORLAB doesn't allow you to just get one extension. You have to, they don't provide URLs to this, the whole file. So, no, there's, you can get individual HDUs. You can now, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I haven't revisited it for quite some time. Last time I checked, it was not, uh, that was not a capability to be offered. Have you, have you thought about the ability to do small cutouts rather than a sense or even a multi-extension, one of the HDUs within a multi-extension fits? And in particular, right. trying to do cutouts that may be cut across multiple images right so the the um ssois will return the x and y of in if again if the wss is properly known uh the cbc's uh storage system definitely allows you to do that so you can do a positional you can you can do a positional search with a radius and it will return the sub raster of two or three or four adjacent uh, HDUs of, a, of an image, um, which is fine. I, people, I don't know. Um, I personally don't use it, but that's because I have sort of an insider knowledge of how things work. Uh, and so I tend to convert to X and Y cutouts, uh, which are also allowed in, 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 uh, in the um, uh, CDC uh, storage inventory system. Uh, and so I don't do the RE and cutouts. I do the X and Y cutouts because I'm doing you know, conversions on the fly. And, and the last part of this question was, have you thought, is there any benefit? You, you're taking essentially the raw images that are coming from after they've been processed, the actual images in the projection that comes out of the camera with a WCS associated with it. Do, are there any advantages or disadvantages of maybe doing a generalized reprojection of that to a common pixelization scheme that might make right. it easier to pull out sub images? Yeah. So for SSIS, the goal is to leave the data as it is mm -hmm. uh, and not to do anything else, particularly since most of it is off site. Uh, 
And so there's no way I'm going to go and reproject all of the hypersupreme cam data, uh, for example, and have that say to the CDC and have that, you know, if, if reprojected data is available, I will index it, but I'm not going to go and reproject it myself. For the stuff that's sitting within the CDC, um, at the moment at least, there's not, there hasn't been a demand to have the reprojected uh, images. Uh, uh, you're basically the first person to ask in the history of. Uh, I've ever, uh, whereas, uh, so uh, the, uh, in fact, in the actual archive, we store the data as delivered by the telescope. So even though I personally have a bunch of approved LECSs for uh, data, um, I don't, we don't apply that to the stuff in the archive because our, our principle is archive what we were given, not uh, don't change any files on disk. And so the debate had been, well, maybe we should make a second copy of it where the WCS has been approved. Um, but uh, uh, we, nothing's come of that at this point. Okay, thanks. Other, other questions for uh, Stephen? One thing that I... I'm curious about is like, what are your plans? What are the plans for LSST uh, and doing something like this? And are you planning to do something completely, uh, you know, in my last slide, I had a couple of bullet points that I didn't speak to about um, how one could do this. I mean, the, the plan is definitely L SSOS will ingest all of the LSST metadata uh, so that it, you can do searches on it. However, you can also, um, um, you, I could imagine that you guys would build something based on Thor or Adam or whatever it is, or SSOS, or you could also just wait till I index it, which I will, and then use the API to do your searches that way. And is, is there any plans going on at LSST at this point? I don't know the details of what the solar system um, group, maybe Henry has a better insight into what services are going to be provided by LSST or Ruben. Or is Henry on this call? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah different Henry. Okay. So I was thinking of Henry. Henry Hugh is the person who is the heaviest user of SSOIS and is the one who caused trouble. But that, that's not you. Um. I thought, well, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm on a, I'm, I'm calling in on a phone, so sorry if the quality is bad. Um, yeah, I, I mean, SSOIS is part of the, um, the Canadian in-kind contribution, so, um, which is still kind of being worked out, but it's definitely part of uh, the package, so, um, so we'll be going through uh, JJ and uh, Wes Fraser um, to discuss, like, the exact details of, like, what we'd like to get out of SSOAS, but um, it's definitely a big part of our plans uh, and especially from the Canadian uh, contribution. Okay. Um, that's interesting. They haven't told me that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, but that's, that's good to know. So I had one more question, which was, um, Thinking about the the scale of getting up to Rubin and potentially also your SKA, how are you transitioning? Thinking about the difference between on premises and cloud type resources. Okay, well that's uh, a slightly different topic, uh, but uh, one that I can speak to. So, as I was saying to you a bit before the this meeting, uh, before before the talk. Uh, we work with an organization called the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, which provides uh, uh, DRI uh, resources to all community researchers. Researchers, currently, as I was saying at the beginning, we're at the two petabyte level with them, and then we will be spending a fair amount of, and that they're providing that to us for for free, uh, or free to us anyway. Uh, we're looking now much more at a model where we the uh, uh, one branch, the Canadian government, the National Research Council transfers considerable funds to this other branch of the Canadian government in exchange for um, 
uh, resources. Commercial cloud is not part of the picture uh, at this point. Uh, we can get, uh, they, these guys, because they're an academic institution, they get the educational discount for in terms of hardware. Uh, it's vastly cheaper to work with them to, than to with any of the commercial cloud providers. We are keeping the back of our minds that if we need bursty stuff that, that comes up, then we would look at commercial cloud. But again, we would be getting that via the same organization, which is also looking at commercial cloud for bursty applications. But again, because they're a large, uh, a very, I mean, they're much larger than us because it also includes high energy particle physics. Um, and so the, it's also all being done through this organization. They actually have a, quite a substantial amount of uh, resources on premises, but not our premises. It's uh, uh, their premises. So it's not commercial cloud, but it is cloud. Okay, um, well, thank you. If we can thank Stephen once more for that uh, fascinating talk. Um, we will uh, be having the, just to give everyone the next talk, Link Tech talk, which will be on July the 13th on uh, the usual Thursday. And this, uh, the next tech talk will be the, by the alert broker team from the University of Pittsburgh and Google. So that will be a talk by Michael Woodvesey, Troy Rain, and Chris Hernandez, talking about how they built out an alert broker um, using uh, different Google services. Um, so uh, thank you all for attending and thank you again, Stephen.